and thank you so much for being here today and joining us for the Cobre on Opioids and Overdose Lecture Series um, that we host through Rhode Island Hospital. I'm Kirsten Langdon. I'm a researcher and psychologist that's based in the Department of Psychiatry at Rhode Island Hospital. Um, and I also have some pilot funds um, through the Cobre on Opioids and Overdose. So I'm so thrilled today to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kate McHugh for today's presentation. Dr. McHugh is an associate psychologist in the Division of Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction at McLean Hospital, and she's also an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. McHugh's research is broadly focused on the co-occurrence of anxiety and substance use disorders, and as you'll see from her CV, she's published extensively in this area with over 140 manuscripts and book chapters. She currently has several grants funded through NIH and NIDA that seek to examine cognitive and effective processes that are relevant to opiate use disorder with the goal of informing the development of novel treatments to improve outcomes for this population. And today, Dr. McHugh will be presenting on the role of mental health with opiate use. Um, so we're so fortunate to have her here and really look forward to hearing more about this topic from her. Um, and before we get started, just um, a kind of a quick reminder that if you have any questions that come up um, throughout the presentation, feel free to put those questions into the chat box. And at the end of the Q&A period, both Gail and I will help to um, facilitate those questions. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. McHugh. And again, thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. And thank you for the invitation. I do have to admit, uh, I saw my mother for Mother's Day yesterday, and she was very upset that this was being done remotely, and that a box from seven stars was not going to be coming her way in the next 48 hours. So um, she was very upset, but um, glad, glad that we can connect in some ways. Um, so I should be able to share my screen here, hopefully. Uh, all right, can folks see that okay? Yeah, but thank you. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for, for the chance to, to chat with you all about this. I'm going to try to get through the material uh, relatively quickly to spend as much time as we can on, on questions and discussion. would be really curious to hear what um, you all are seeing in this, in this area and thoughts and ideas that you all have. Um, so I'm going to talk on the very broad topic of mental health and, and opioid misuse. I'm going to zoom in on a couple of topics that are um, relevant for overdose in particular. Um, but I want to start with a little bit of an overview, um, in part because I actually think the data suggest that even though much of our focus on opioid misuse prevention has been on pain, that we are really missing something by not considering mental health more. Um, and in part, mental health actually might be the linkage between pain and opioid misuse. So I feel like I can make a little bit of a case for that. Um, uh, just some disclosures, uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest, but do um, receive funding from a handful of uh, foundation and federal sources. Um, so a quick overview on this. Um, I always like to start with uh, this topic of where are we with the opioid epidemic? You know, it, it continues to be all over the news and, and we still hear the term opioid epidemic. It's still at the DHHS at the federal level uh, is identified as an epidemic. Um, and, and there's been a tremendous amount of resources and energy and attention poured into this topic. Um, and, and I think we have sort of good news, bad news. I think there are some things that are trending in a good direction. We are certainly well down from the historic highs, um, depending on, on what marker you're using, sort of 2011 to 2015, um, in terms of opioid misuse, number of people misusing, number of people with an opioid use disorder, um, number of people initiating opioid misuse, all of those numbers are actually well down and trending down. The places where I think we still should have a lot of concern is, is the first one is there still are a lot of people coming into the pipeline. So I think opioid initiation or misuse initiation is an important statistic for us to keep an eye on. The 2019 data suggested that, that 1.6 million people first misused a prescription opioid in 19 about 50,000 first misused heroin. I would put an asterisk on this. Um, for people who are familiar with the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, it is almost certainly grossly underestimating heroin use. So, so put an asterisk on that, assume that that is quite a bit higher. So, so there's still a lot of people coming in the pipeline um, and the demographics of that group are actually changing a fair bit. Um, and overdose deaths, unfortunately, uh, are really not trending down. There was a small reduction in 2018. Um, and since then, the numbers have gone up further. Um, the early CDC evidence 
Um, I don't know if anyone else has seen this. I have not yet seen this broken down by opioids versus other drugs, but the preliminary CDC evidence for 2019 through 2020 suggests that the, this is the highest uh, number of drug overdose deaths on record, up over 83,000, which is up quite a bit. So I, I think we're actually seeing that number continue to escalate in a really concerning way. Um, in part because we're seeing now this really growing dual epidemic of opioid and stimulant use. And, and if you go back several decades, if you look at the trends, you know, back to the, the 70s, even 60s, you tend to get these um, uh, sort of sequential either um, opioid overdose epidemics or stimulant overdose epidemics. And, and you'll get an opioid one and that'll start to tick down. As that starts to tick down, you'll see stimulants go up and vice versa. What we're actually seeing now is both hitting at the same time where stimulant use is going through the roof, opioid use is not down that much. So we're really getting what a lot of people are referring to now as a dual epidemic, which is quite concerning. Um, and as I alluded to before, we're really seeing some shifting demographics. And I think this really highlights that we can't take our foot off the gas with this issue because many of the groups that were not as affected when this was primarily an opioid analgesic issue in the late 90s through 2010, um, a lot of those groups are actually starting to escalate a fair bit. So you're seeing really significant increases in Hispanic and Latinx populations, in people identify as Black or African American, and you're actually starting to see some shifts in women as well, with actually women starting to catch up to men in terms of a number of these um, public health markers. So yes, things are getting better, but gosh, we should still be worried about this for a lot of different reasons, you know, most predominant of which is overdose deaths. So if we look at where does mental health play a role? Again, so much of the attention has been on pain. Uh, I think in the NIH has focused pretty heavily on pain. A lot of the professional organizations, American Psychological Association, I can say has been laser focused on pain as the opioid prevention strategy. But if, if we look at mental health, we see a lot of risk markers here too. And you can think from, from uh, sort of non-problematic prescription use up through opioid use disorder. So people with psychiatric disorders are about two to four times as likely to be prescribed an opioid as those without. Um, they're about two to three times more likely to misuse opioids. Um, the low end of this estimate is controlling for that difference in opioid prescription, in case people were wondering about the access question. Um, about four to 11 times more likely to have opioid dependence. This is DSM-4 dependence, not just physiological dependence. Um, and the risk does appear to be bi-directional. Um, I'll put an asterisk on this as well because our, our Estimates of risk are all based on temporal sequencing, what, what happens first, um, which should not be assumed to be causal in any way, but we know that opioid misuse is associated with incident mood and anxiety disorders and vice versa. Mood and anxiety disorders are associated with incident opioid misuse and opioid use disorder. So we, we tend to see that risk in both directions. Um, and I would also note that the, the comorbidity, particularly for anxiety and depression, is about as high in opioid use disorder as it is with any of the other substance use disorders. So you, you think about the highest risk, uh, particularly for, for depressive and anxiety disorders, traumatic stress-related disorders, is gonna be opioids, sedatives, and alcohol uh, tend to be the highest. Um, so there's, there's a particularly high psychiatric loading in folks with opioid use disorder. I would say actually here, the link between psychiatric disorders and symptoms uh, and overdose, the literature is actually quite mixed. So You'll see some studies that find a link um, in the direction that you would expect, um, that more psychiatric symptoms or disorders associated with risk for overdose. Other studies have not found that link. Um, my best guess is to the mixed literature is it, either that the link is weak or this is just a hard thing to uh, um, assess because you need just tremendously large sample sizes to be able to detect a link between an individual difference variable and overdose. Um, and to get a study that's large enough to power adequately, you're probably not getting a really great diagnostic assessment in those. So um, if, if we had better data, what would we see? I'm not sure, but I would again, just say it's, it's mixed and in part, that's probably because of the quality of the studies in part. Um, I do also wanna mention sex and gender differences because this will, this will come up again um, and when we look at sex and gender differences in opioids, there's a number of different domains where you see differences in both preclinical and clinical models. Um, in the clinical literature, differences in psychiatric disorders are probably one of the most robust sex differences that we see. Um, and we see it in two domains. So we see main effects where women with 
opioid use disorder are more likely to have a psychiatric disorder or serious mental illness per the SAMHSA definition. Um, just to show, I have a, a couple of graphs here, just as an example. This is from a large multi-site clinical trial that we published some sex difference data on. And you see a, across the board, women were significantly more likely to have chronic pain, uh, more than twice as likely to have major depression, and also more than twice as likely to have PTSD. So this is a really major difference in terms of psychiatric illness in, in women and men with opioid use disorder. And consistent with that, we actually see that women are more likely to report misusing opioids to cope with pain or negative affect than men, uh, which sort of makes sense with the higher loading. Um, the other piece here is that you also see an interaction effect, which is where this gets interesting, is not only are women more likely to have a psychiatric disorder, but the link between psychiatric disorders and opioid risk is higher in women. So, so in other words, if uh, the association between a psychiatric symptom and the likelihood of opioid misuse is stronger in women than it is in men, it's moderated by sex. So the fact that we see both main interaction effects here, I think is a uh, a really interesting factor that I don't think we entirely understand. Um, and, and hopefully we're doing some work in this area. I know not a number of other people are, hopefully we'll start to clarify that in the coming years. So why might we see this big difference um, or this linkage between mental health and opioid use? So I wanna talk a little bit about reinforcement. So when we think about most substances of abuse, we usually think about reinforcement as reward, but these are also potently relieving substances, particularly opioids. So if you think about our stress system, the stress off part of our system is the opioid system. So anything that's gonna impact the opioid system is in many ways gonna have a significant impact on stress. Um, so if we think about opioids, the worse the distress is, the more reinforcing it's gonna be, the more relief you can afford by using an opioid. Um, the thing that certainly I think anyone uh, who's listening who does um, clinical practice work, myself included, we know that one of the toughest things for us to contend with is proximal relief beats distal relief uh, every time. So in other words, if we have some kind of, let's say CBT strategy or behavioral strategy that might help somebody to get relief, almost always it's gonna take longer than something like an opioid. And that's something that we always have to contend with is that proximal relief is much more reinforcing than something that takes more effort and will be a little bit slower. Um, so in many ways, we can see opioid use as a quick fix. So as we're thinking about mental health, as we're thinking about particularly these stress-related disorders, opioids can really provide tremendous relief. Um, this is some uh, NSDUH, uh, National Survey on Drug Use and Health data, reasons for last opioid misuse. These are not in people with an opioid use disorder, just anyone who misused an opioid. And you see here, although pain relief is the number one reason, you see a lot of stress and mental health related elements in here to relax, to sleep, to deal with emotions. Um, this gets even higher if you start to look in folks with an opioid use disorder. But these are even in people with relatively low level use, you see a ton of stress relief motives for opioid use. So what does this have to do with pain? So we also know, and again, I've sort of criticized that we spend so much time focusing on pain, but bear with me here. Uh, we know that pain is a risk factor for the spectrum of negative opioid related outcomes. It's associated with uh, initiation of opioid misuse. We know that it's associated with the development of opioid use disorder. We know it's associated with negative outcomes in people with opioid use disorder. However, again, if we come back to this proximal versus distal, if you look at people with chronic pain and opioid use disorder, so if you have someone coming into, you know, let's say an outpatient MOUD clinic and they have chronic pain, they're not necessarily gonna do any worse than someone without chronic pain. And this is a finding that's been replicated a bunch. And I think people, myself included, have been surprised by this, but just having chronic pain on board is not necessarily gonna yield a worse opioid use disorder outcome. However, when again, you look more proximally, week to week fluctuations in pain are a risk factor for opioid relapse in this population. Um, and you can think of this as actually a very similar story to the craving literature, where you know if you look at baseline craving and outcomes, maybe you see a weak association at best. But if you look at people's craving fluctuation week to week, it does actually tend to predict relapse or use. So when we look at something like pain, the more proximal we're looking, the stronger the relationship is. The other piece to this is what actually predicts that increase in risk that who with chronic pain will misuse an opioid or whose 
fluctuation in pain week to week might tip into an opioid relapse. And it all comes down to this affective component of pain. If we think of the affective component of pain as the motivational component, it's the part that, um, not necessarily the somatic experience, but the part of us that interprets the somatic experience as aversive or distressing. Um, so in many ways, this comes across as, as sort of an anxiety process. Um, it's the part of us that wants to get rid of pain. Pain catastrophizing is one really relevant construct here. Um, for people who aren't familiar with this, it's very similar to catastrophizing as we would think more broadly in, in a cognitive therapy model, but the interpretation of pain as harmful, as unending, as unmanageable, um, when pain is interpreted that way, it tends to amplify the pain and it tends to motivate you to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Again, that, that proximal relief. Um, we know that this affective component, again, whether we think about pain catastrophizing specifically or pain-related anxiety, this is associated with opioid craving, it's associated with opioid misuse. This seems to be the thing or one of the things that links a pain experience to the misuse of opioids as opposed to just the use of opioids. Um, we know that this is also something that even predicts poor pain-related functioning in people with chronic pain. So regardless of pain severity, if you have that stronger affective component of pain, you're more likely to have functional interference. This is a thing that seems to influence how much people will avoid in response to their pain or how much people might uh, engage in maladaptive behaviors in response to their pain. So there's really a growing literature that suggests that this is really the part of pain that results in the negative opioid outcomes. Again, it's that interpretation, that affective component of pain. Which leads us to this question. If we think about both mental health and pain, do we actually see differences in people's sensitivity to relief? So oftentimes, and, and I think the literature is really well characterized in terms of sensitivity to reward, that different people have, have different levels of uh, functioning of their reward system, the degree to which they learn rewards, the degree to which they can shift contingencies. We don't know much about relief. So this is something that we've done you know, research on for a number of years now. One construct here that I think is really relevant is this construct of distress and tolerance. So I think we can think of this as having two pieces. So distress and tolerance in part is a sensitivity to distress. That I can't handle this. I don't like this, this is bad, I can't handle it. These sort of negative interpretations of distress which tend to amplify distress. Um, you can think of panic disorder as probably the case in point here. You feel a somatic symptom, you interpret that as dangerous or risky and then it amplifies that somatic symptom. So that, that's one piece. The second piece, is if I can't handle this and I think it's bad and I think it's risky, I wanna get rid of it. And when do I wanna get rid of it? I wanna get rid of it as soon as possible. Um, and here's where you get into the quick fix behaviors. And this is where you see really the strongest links with distress and tolerance are things like substance use, non-suicidal self-injury, to a lesser extent, things like avoidance, but things that will get that quick relief. So if we think of this as potentially an individual difference variable that marks that sensitivity to relief, um, we see really tremendous links with opioid use here. Um, I'm not going to present, we, we have a bunch of older data that show that people with opioid use disorder have really heightened distress and tolerance and it's associated with negative outcomes. Um, you also see this in low level opioid use. So if you look at folks with chronic pain who are prescribed an opioid, distress and tolerance is one of the things that can help you to distinguish who misuses and who does not. So this was in, in a group of folks with chronic pain, people who had misused their opioids had much higher both self-reported distress intolerance as well as behavioral distress intolerance. So you can index this in a couple of different ways. Um, so we see really significant differences between uh, in, in distress intolerance between people who do and don't misuse opioids. Again, suggesting that it's this emotional response, this relief propensity that really links pain to opioid misuse. Um, I was gonna pause for questions, but maybe we'll just, uh, I know Kurt, Kirsten, you mentioned doing uh, questions at the end. So um, hold those thoughts. I'm gonna dig into benzodiazepines uh, before we get to that. So I'm gonna talk about two areas of mental health that are particularly relevant for overdose. Um, first is benzodiazepines. So we know that benzos are, are a treatment for things like anxiety, insomnia, also alcohol withdrawal. Um, 
And actually, you know, even as someone who my early training was as a CBT for anxiety person, so in my core, I'm supposed to hate benzos, the data are actually decent as a treatment for anxiety disorders, um, if you look at the clinical trials data. Um, but we know that many people are prescribed uh, benzodiazepines, more than one in 20 people in the US have a prescription. Um, this has, much like we saw with opioids in the early 90s, we see a lot of trends towards increased both numbers of prescribing and dosages. So not only are prescriptions going up, but the quantity of those prescriptions has been going up. Um, unfortunately, these are relatively old data. These are the last uh, published data, uh, large scale published data that are available. I would bet a nickel um, with COVID, you're gonna see prescriptions for benzos going through the roof, um, not just over the past year, but I think probably going forward. So, you know, when, when benzos were first uh, on the market, these were really presented and thought to be a huge upgrade from the barbiturates, which were really what would play this role previously. They don't have abuse potential. These, you know, cure all that ails you. These are wonderful medications. The problem is um, in those early abuse liability studies of benzodiazepines, you saw very low abuse liability. Is it looked like these can't be misused? These are safe, we're in good shape. These are less rewarding than other substances. However, when we actually look at the epidemiologic data, they're misused quite commonly. And in fact, if you actually combine them with the Z drugs, so things like um, Ambien and Lunesta, those, those uh, types of sleep aids, those combined are actually the third most commonly misused drug type in the US after uh, marijuana and opiate analgesics. So it's more commonly misused than things like cocaine, hallucinogens, other stimulants. Um, so certainly there is some level of misuse out there. So who actually might misuse a benzo or not? And, and I can give a piece of context here. There was someone who worked at McLean, she was here just as I started, who was doing research on the misuse of um, some benzos, some Z drugs, and could not get her work funded by NIDA, in part because everybody said benzos aren't an issue, leave it alone, nothing to worry about here. Um, but what you're really starting to see is, again, these epidemiologic data are worsening. Overdose deaths related to benzodiazepines have been going up over the last couple of decades. Misuse has been going up. Um, negative outcomes in older adults have been increasing. So we've started to look at more who is actually at risk. You know, if this is something that in certain populations abuse liability is very low, who are the folks for whom this might become an issue? And I think you can think about two domains here. One is who is going to be exposed to benzos and for whom are they going to be more reinforcing? So again, this comes back to the more distress you have on board, the more relief you're going to get. And, and there's a little bit of abuse liability data that suggests that for people with a substance use disorder or for people with an anxiety disorder, the abuse liability is higher. Which again makes sense, you get more of that relief. Um, so again, if you think about people with substance use disorders, here we have people with a double risk. People with substance use disorders are more likely to be prescribed a benzodiazepine. And again, there's a higher potential for reinforcement. These are some national data that actually show the prevalence of misuse of benzos is tremendously high in people with substance use disorders, especially people with opioid use disorder. Um, so these are, again, National Survey on Drug Use and Health data. So these are lifetime and past year prevalence of benzodiazepine misuse. This is, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, this is people with opioid use disorder. Um, people with alcohol use disorder, I would just note uh, for, for anyone who works with alcohol use disorder, this, this is still a pretty big number. Um, I would say this, we have some treatment seeking data that suggests that it's even higher, about 20% of people, at least that we've seen, have, have some uh, lifetime misuse of a benzodiazepine. So, so don't discount the AUD uh, folks, but in, for opioid use disorder, and we've seen this in the national drug use uh, on health data, we've seen this in treatment seeking data, about 70 to 75% of people with an opioid use disorder have misused a benzo in their lifetime. So this is actually quite common in this population. Um, how does this link to overdose? About 30% of opioid overdose deaths involved a benzodiazepine. So this is a significant contributor. Again, you think if you're adding two CNS depressants, your, your likelihood of overdose is going to be higher. Um, opioids and benzos are often combined for a number of different reasons. So this is a really concerning indicator. Um, we have someone here, and I wish uh, I had his data that we could have presented today, but he's actually found that 
overdose deaths related to benzodiazepines without opioids are also going up in the last couple of years. Um, so ho hopefully soon to come, uh, keep an eye out for that. Robert Kleinman, who's a fellow here, um, has some data on that. So this is a significant contributor to opioid related deaths, something to be really concerned about. That includes even if someone is abstinent from opioids and is on uh, an agonist therapy, so either methadone or buprenorphine, you see an increased risk of, of overdose death if someone's misusing a benzodiazepine, so keep that in mind. So we've been really trying to understand, if you look into the literature, there basically are no treatments for benzodiazepine misuse, I mean, unless, unless we, we extrapolate from um, uh, CBT for other substances. So we've been trying to understand a little bit about why are people misusing benzos. We've done some qualitative work and also a little bit of quantitative work. Um, and it is amazing when you sit down and do the qualitative work, it, it, it is sort of a, a, the way I often describe it to people I'm working with is it's a thermostat drug. I use it to turn down my stimulant high. I use it to turn up my opioid high. I use it to uh, skip forward in time is actually something we hear a lot of people talk about, particularly people who uh, are really struggling with functional impairment and um, don't have a lot to take up their time during the day. They'll say, I can just take a bunch of Xanax and fast forward eight hours. Um, so you see this a lot in playing a lot of different roles. Um, Interestingly, although the, the early research on misuse of benzos and opioid use disorder was done in methadone maintenance treatment programs. And in those studies, basically the upshot, if you look at those as are from a couple decades ago, is people just use it to boost their methadone high. They go, they get their dose, they take some clonopin, they get a little bit of a high from it, and, and it's all sort of an enhancement mode of kind of um, process. What we've actually seen is if you ask people who are, again, these are treatment seekers, Many people, and in fact, about half, say their first reason for misusing a benzo was to manage their anxiety. So even though I, I think much of the narrative has been that this is just a way to boost an opioid high, there are a lot of people who at least perceive themselves to be self-treating with a benzodiazepine. Um, again, as, as someone who was sort of, uh, raised in an anxiety disorder CBT clinic, this suggests to me that maybe we're really grossly undertreating anxiety in this population, um, which, which would not surprise me. So again, you see a lot of people who initially are misusing to manage their anxiety. If you ask people about current misuse, coping is actually by far the number one most common reason for misusing benzos. Um, sleep is another big one here. Uh, many people are misusing benzos to manage their sleep. I hear this a lot from people who try to self-detox from opioids is that you know, the Suboxone helps, but it doesn't help with sleep. So a lot of people will combine Suboxone that they're getting on the street with a benzo to uh, try to sleep. But again, you do also see a lot of these substance related motives like increasing or decreasing drug effects, avoiding withdrawal, et cetera. Um, these, these are some of the most concerning data that we've seen recently. So these are, this is also treatment seekers. So these are folks who are seeking treatment for a substance use disorder. It's not just opioid use disorder. Um, who misused a benzo in the past month. So if we ask them in the past month about co-use, so this isn't just like, you know, I used benzos yesterday and I drank today. It's, are you using them actually at the same time? And zero of our participants said that they did not co-use, meaning that every time they misused a benzo, they were combining it with another substance. Um, so the most common here was alcohol, although you see just about everything in here, Marijuana use uh, with benzos is not uncommon. Um, in our qualitative work, folks primarily have said, um, we haven't heard anything about synergistic effects in terms of the high, but mostly that what they can, what their experience is, is that they can smoke very high THC marijuana and decrease some of the anxiogenic effects. So, so I can really have a, sort of a high THC product and not have any anxiety effects. So that's where a lot of people are combining it. Um, again, you see this a lot with stimulants to come down from a stimulant high. So again, this, this is concerning because as we start talking about co-use, we start thinking about overdose risk, um, particularly if you're looking about combining this with alcohol, with opioids, um, that's where we really have to get concerned. So this, this is really, I think, an essential area. We really need treatments here, um, in part because if someone is actually dependent on a benzodiazepine, the taper off of that benzodiazepine can be a real nightmare for folks. Um, we do some of that work, even with folks who aren't misusing, but people who have been on a long-term benzo, for anyone who's ever worked with someone on a taper, 
goodness gracious, can people be miserable? And it's at times, uh, we had somebody recently, I think it took us 18 months to taper them all the way down um, with really intensive, slow taper plus good CBT. Um, this is an area where I think we really do need a lot more work. Um, I will again circle back to sex differences. This is a particular concern for women. Um, so these are actually CDC overdose death data here on the far left. And you can see this sort of a cool way that they, they did the figure. So to, to the left of the zero here, uh, these are the 1999 benzodiazepine overdose death rates based on age group. To the right, these are the 2017 benzodiazepine death rates. Uh, so de depending on the age group here, uh, it varies a little bit in terms of how much the risk has gone up, but this is an 830% increase in deaths in this 30 to 64 age group, which is really tremendous. Um, we also know that women with substance use disorders are more likely to be prescribed a benzodiazepine than men, are more likely to misuse a benzodiazepine than men. So we see this, again, at least this exposure difference really differing by sex. Um, is this just attributable to the fact that women are more likely than men to struggle with anxiety disorders? Perhaps. Um, I don't think we have a good sense yet of whether or not that accounts for the difference. Again, as we think about interaction effects, we also see this. So I can walk you through this. So this is uh, on the left, this uh, sort of ugly old figure is from a number of years ago, where we looked at folks in methadone maintenance treatment and we looked at anxiety sensitivity. So, so for folks who aren't familiar with anxiety sensitivity, it's sort of a fear of anxiety symptoms and sensations that if my heart rate goes up or if I feel nervous, um, that I'm almost fearful of that anxiety symptom, very similar to distress tolerance. Um, and what we saw was people who had more of this fear of anxiety were more likely to misuse benzos. So we have sedatives here, this is almost exclusively benzos, but only if they were women. So you did not see a difference in men, you only saw the difference in women. So we saw this, we thought, oh, this is interesting. We published it. At the time, I remember thinking, oftentimes these, these sex moderators don't replicate. Um, they're sort of a, now, now you see me, now you don't. So we did it at the time and we thought, okay, this is interesting, but we're, we're really cautious in our conclusions. And then what we actually did was we replicated that a couple of years ago. Um, so you'll see, hopefully people can, this isn't cut off by Zoom, but this is actually looking at uh, in men and women with opioid use disorders. So these are actually inpatients. The association between anxiety sensitivity score and days of benzodiazepine misuse. So you actually see a little bit of a dose response here. But again, you see a strong association in women, nothing in men. Um, we've actually also replicated this in alcohol use disorder recently. So I'm, I'm feeling more confident that this is a real, a real deal finding. Um, but again, this also suggests that not only is the likelihood of misuse higher in women, but what might be putting women at risk for misuse is different than it is for men. So the last thing I want to touch on here in, in uh, 10 or so minutes before we open it up for questions is this idea of suicide and overdose. Um, so, you know, as overdose deaths have been on the rise, suicide deaths have also been on the rise. And, and if you actually combine the two, um, you actually lose any regional variation, which is sort of interesting. Um, for anyone who's interested in that, Ian Rocket has at West Virginia has done some really tremendous work on that recently. But again, we, we've seen both suicides and overdoses increase over the last um, couple of decades. And one question is, is, are these truly distinct events? So what you tend to see, and, and we do this, I think, clinically and, and certainly from a surveillance perspective, is we, we, we force things into one of two buckets if we're talking about a, an overdose fatality. We either call it unintentional, which means the person had no intention of dying, in which case it's an overdose, it's a quote-unquote accident, or we jam it into this bucket of intentional, which means this person intended to harm themselves, intended to kill themselves, and we call it a suicide. Now, note for, for anyone who's familiar with the sort of uh, determination of death, uh, statistics at the national level, you see a lot of deaths in this actually very state to state that will go into an undetermined category, which means they, they weren't able to jam it into one of these two buckets, which is interesting in and of itself. But, but this assumption that this is truly a binary um, is an assumption that, that I think we should be challenging. Do truly we see you either have no intention or 100% intention, or do we really actually see something more along a spectrum of intention to die that might precede these opioid use events. So why does this matter? 
Um, certainly from a surveillance perspective, it matters. Again, how we're thinking about um, what a fatality event uh, should be categorized as may impact things like how we dedicate resources, how we engage in prevention. So if we think about someone coming into an emergency department um, with a non-fatal opioid overdose, they, they get Narcan, they get to the ED, they're okay. If you truly believe that was 100% unintentional, you know, probably the best, the standard of care would be to start them on buprenorphine, get them into a bridge clinic, you know, get, get them into medication, um, and, and good psychotherapy, um, give them some education, you know, sort of wraparound services to prevent the, the overdose death, get Narcan to the family. However, if there was a suicidal component to that, that's not going to be the right intervention. It might be part of the right intervention, but that's also a place where maybe suicide prevention is also a part of the picture. So this distinction is actually quite important. Um, I would also offer up, again, sorry, keep previewing data that I'm not actually going to share, but you also see in terms of this determination of death, you see tremendous racial bias in how these determinations are made. So I think there's also a really important equity issue here. Um, that again, if, if people have questions, we, we do actually have some, some data on that that are about to come out as well. So if we look at, at suicide and opioid use disorder, it is tremendously prevalent, um, six to 14 fold more common than in the general population, higher than most other substance use disorders. Um, in people, and, and this statistic blows my mind every time I see it, but treatment seekers with an opioid use disorder, about 30 to 45%, and this has been replicated time after time after time, internationally in the US, about 30 to 45% report a history of a suicide attempt of people with an opioid use disorder, just tremendously high risk. And I think there are several pieces of data that support an overlap between what we would typically call unintentional and intentional. So 20 to 30% of patients report a history of both events, both a suicide attempt and a non-fatal overdose. Both of these events share risk factors. We know that suicidality, and, and sorry to use a very broad term here, this is sort of a, a mix of suicidal behaviors and suicidal uh, ideation is associated with future fatal opioid overdose. Interesting thing, and, and especially, I think this is important for folks who are working clinically, the majority of suicide attempts in people with opioid use disorder involve a fatal drug overdose, which again further blurs this distinction. Oftentimes, and again, this, this is some qualitative work that's, that's been done out of Australia, is oftentimes if it is something where the person is um, very strongly intending it to, to be a suicide attempt, they will use a different combination of drugs than they typically will use. So if someone typically uses heroin, they might use heroin along with an opiate analgesic and alcohol or benzo. So, so that can be one indicator, although it's, it's a very rough one. Um, we know opioids are the most commonly used drug in fatal suicide poisonings. So we have quite a bit of evidence to support overlap. Um, and we've done some work and there are a couple of other groups who have also been doing some work on this to look at um, actually asking people, what was their experience prior to an opioid overdose? Um, so we, we did this in, uh, I can give a little bit of context. So these are folks with opioid use disorder, they're seeking treatment. Um, and we ask them a bunch of questions about what were you thinking prior to your most recent opioid overdose? Um, and you know, for, for our folks, again, we see about 30 to 45%, depending on which sample we take have a history of suicide attempt, about 40% report a history of an overdose event. So we see pretty high loading of both of these. So one question that we asked is, how likely did you think it would be that you would overdose? So when you were you know, in that episode of opioid use, how likely did you think it would be that you would overdose? And we defined overdose here as an event that was severe enough that it would require medical treatment to prevent a, a particularly bad outcome, including death. So you see here, only 30% of people said that they thought there was no chance that they would overdose. And more than 15% actually saw there being a very high likelihood of overdose. So I think this, this raises sort of an interesting question of if someone is engaging in a risk behavior where they think there is a very high likely, uh, likelihood of an event that could be fatal if they didn't get medical attention, you know, can we call that fully accidental, fully unintentional? What, what's actually going on with that thought process there that we might be able to um, intervene on? So then we ask people about their desire to die. You know, at that time that you were using opioids, how strong was your desire to die? 
Um, and here we see, we see, again, we see some variability that more than 50% reported some desire to die at that point. And when you talk to, to, to folks, again, sort of more, more qualitatively, you hear really a whole range of people saying everything from, you know, I, I knew there was a chance I could die and if I did, it wouldn't be the worst thing. Or, you know, I knew there was a chance, but I just needed to sleep, I didn't care. Um, two people who said I actually did intend to harm myself. So you, you see this real continuum. Um, and again, if we look at pretty much anything in mental health, almost everything does lie along these uh, continuum. So thinking about this, thinking about some of these gray areas may give us a different opportunity for overdose prevention in this population. Um, let me see. I didn't have, so I, I have one more, one more data point that we asked most recently as a smaller sample, which probably I didn't pop this, the figure in here. We also asked people about their intention to die in a, in a more recent sample. Um, and you actually see fewer people reporting intention to die than we see with desire to die. So interestingly, those appear to be distinct constructs. So again, from a clinical perspective, assessing not just intention, but also desire is probably something that is worth doing because I think if you just assess intention, you may miss some opportunity for prevention or some identification of risk factors that you might if you just say, did you intend to die at that time? Um, so again, this is something that we're, we're digging more into and, and is consistent. Again, there are a couple of other groups that have looked, doing more qualitative work, have found similar patterns. So I think really starting to understand what is that gray area and what might that mean for overdose prevention for folks? You know, it, should suicide prevention be part of it? Should people be tracked to suicide prevention depending on um, you know, risk factors or some, some report of desire to die? Um, I think those will be important next steps. So I want to end on one thing. I'm going to take two minutes to do this so we can have 15 minutes for questions. Um, when we think about mental health, I think this is really a place where behavior therapy is going to be important. So again, as, as a CBT person, I have been really bummed by the data on adding CBT to buprenorphine. Um, so in the Drug Abuse Treatment Act of 2000, which was the uh, legislation that allowed for outpatient buprenorphine prescribing, it required that the practitioner have the capacity to refer patients for appropriate counseling. Effectively, this has been interpreted as you need to some sort to be able to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, this has been interesting and, and in many ways in, in certain regions of the country has actually been a barrier to buprenorphine prescribing if people don't have access to these services, which is a whole other, uh, that's, a, that's a whole other can of worms. But the evidence for adding behavior therapy to buprenorphine is limited. There have been a number of trials, including very large multi-site trials. There have been trials of individual drug counseling. There have been trials of CBT. And if you add buprenorphine, add behavior therapy to buprenorphine, it does not offer substantial benefit in those trials. Um, you know, this, this again is, is hard for me to wrap my head around and I'll offer a couple of critiques, although I'm trying to be a good empiricist here. So, so there are a couple of critiques of the literature. One is that um, these trials tend to have a very robust medication management arm, much more robust than you would see typically in, in real practice. Um, you know, 30 minutes of time with the physician or um, other prescriber, pretty structured, but, but still. Statistical power, sure, there's some, some criticism there. Um, my biggest criticism, my biggest read of the literature is not that it's a failure of behavior therapy to work. It, it's more of a, people don't necessarily want behavior therapy. So the dosing of behavior therapy has actually been very low, um, despite I think pretty extensive efforts to get people in the door. So um, do people want the product we're offering is, is I think maybe actually the more relevant question here. But all that aside, if we think about where might behavior therapy play a role in medication for opioid use disorder, mental health, I think is really one of the places where, where this can, can play a role in part, thinking about what is medication not hitting well enough? You know, can you get a little bit of an antidepressant effect if you're on buprenorphine? Yes, um, not a super robust one in people with opioid use disorder, but you can get some benefit. But if we look at mental health, this is really a place where we might be able to target behavior therapies more directly in a way that can actually boost medication um, effectiveness. So I'm gonna give one example here, um, sorry, before I get to this. This is really where we see treatment non-response. And again, Regina Sinha's group at Yale has, has done brilliant work in this area. These are some of our data. Um, 
And this is looking at stress reactivity prior to treatment in people with opioid use disorder. So just to orient you to what you're looking at, this is negative affect. This is baseline before we induce stress, and this is right after we induce stress. It's an individualized stressor. So, so we give people, it's script-driven imagery. It's a really potent stressor. The people with a stronger response to stress are the people who are more likely to relapse. So you see, these are the people who did not relapse down at the bottom. These are the people who did relapse up at the top. So you see some of these stress and affective related variables might be things that we can target. Um, what we've seen, and this is, um, uh, we should actually be sending this out sometime this week, is folks with PTSD. So this is one of the big multi-site trials. It was an 11 site uh, NIDA clinical trials network study where they added behavior therapy to buprenorphine. And it's a study that found no benefit of behavior therapy. When we broke it down by PTSD, if you did not have PTSD, did not matter whether or not you got behavior therapy. You could just get buprenorphine, you could get behavior therapy and buprenorphine, about a 50% treatment response rate, which is pretty, pretty typical in terms of response rate for buprenorphine. If you had PTSD and you did not get behavior therapy, you dropped below a 40% treatment response rate. If you got behavior therapy, you were over 65%. So we see here that there may be certain subgroups of people. When we aggregate everybody, maybe behavior therapy doesn't matter, but certain subgroups of people actually adding behavior therapy to medication may be particularly important. So as folks are thinking about this behavior therapy piece of the, the puzzle, I think targeting mental health with those behavior therapies may be a particularly promising opportunity for us to try to boost outcomes in this population. So, uh, okay, I'm just going to mention this really quickly. The other thing just to keep in mind, when we do think about what outcomes are we using in our clinical trials, there's some, some value in thinking about, is that the same thing that patients actually want? Um, the FDA led a panel in 2018 where they talk about with people with lived experience, providers, all kinds of folks. And they said, what do you consider to be the most meaningful benefit of treatment with opioid use disorder? If we have, as the FDA, are deciding whether to improve a treatment, what do you want? And desire to function in society was one of the most commonly used ones. Again, if we think about what do we, you know, are you still using opioids or not? It's typically what we're looking at. For people, they want to function in society. They want their mood to be better, their craving, their sleep disruption to be better. You know, certainly reduction in opioid use and abstinence was mentioned, but you know, keeping in mind what, what are we actually looking at in terms of our outcomes, I think is, is something just to make sure we all have on our radar. Uh, and that's it. So hopefully I'll have plenty of time for questions. Thank you all. We'd love to hear any questions or thoughts. And I will get rid of this. Thank you, Dr. McHugh. This is Dale. Um, Tarly, you had a question for Dr. McHugh? and I should have allowed you to talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. McHugh, for this uh, talk. Um, I had some questions about measurement from your earlier slides. The first was on sex and gender differences, and just curious if you had a sense of any potential kind of risk of confounding due to um, like gender differences in self-report of symptoms and, and help seeking and things like that, and then also potential of, you know, confounding by kind of different gender differences in how clinicians assign diagnoses. Um, and then the second one was about your, your finding or the findings you reported on pain catastrophizing mm -hmm. and actually how um, distinguishing between pain catastrophizing and pain severity is measured, is done. Um, Cause that seems like kind of a, a tricky thing to disentangle that I'm curious about. So thanks so much. Awesome. So, so thank you for, for a great question. So I had to write them down because my, my short-term memory has worsened in COVID. I don't know what anybody else. Um, so in terms of the confounds, yes, the, the gender confounds, I think, are a real concern. Um, I, I don't have any data to base this on other than um, just being a skeptic. You know, is it true that women are twice as likely as men to suffer from an anxiety disorder? <laughs> Or is the, the phenotype that we've defined of anxiety disorder one that is actually biased towards women based on all kinds of historical issues? Um, I, I would lean towards at least partially the latter. Although I do think there are some data to suggest that there, there is true biological difference that, that may increase risk in women. So in terms of the confound, yes, that is always something that I worry about. I, I would offer in terms of your concern about sort of treatment seeking and help seeking, you do see that sex difference, even if you look at population level data. So even if you look at sort of broad epidemiologic survey data, 
you still do see that sex difference in prevalence. That doesn't get rid of the reporting or assessment bias, um, but I think that does clean up some of the treatment seeking bias potentially. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's certainly a, a, a concern. Um, that having been said, with my clinician hat on, if I have someone who's coming in and, and saying they're anxious and reporting all those symptoms, um, I, th I think that's salient for me, at least clinically. But yeah, of course, I think, you know, are we, I would less be less concerned that we're over-diagnosing in women and more concerned that we're under-diagnosing in men. Um, on your pain catastrophizing versus pain severity, um, it's, it's always tricky. It's sort of the same thing like trying to assess anxiety severity versus anxiety sensitivity. Um, when it's when the risk factor can amplify the symptom, um, they're hard to disentangle. I would offer that in terms of measurement, um, pain severity and pain catastrophizing are uh, correlated, but certainly distinct in terms of how well correlated they are. Um, but yes, that's I mean that's always something. Again, same thing with any kind of amplification factor. If it's amplifying the symptom, then th there's going to be some confound there. Um, the best research in terms of pain is going to do quantitative sensory testing. We're actually getting in and objectively looking at pain, things like pain tolerance. But um, yeah, the measurement of the stuff is always tricky. Thank you. Uh, Adelia, you had a question? Hi, yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for this presentation. Really meaningful and, and really important topics. My question is actually around the, uh, the overdose data um, and the increase uh, of benzos, I guess, in the overdose data. I, I imagine the, that pressed pills, which have been a thing lately, you know, those Xanax pills that are actually contain fentanyl contributed to that. And also whether there's any data on you know, whether benzos are being used as adulterants. So for example, if people are using it, but they're using it unknowingly. Yes, so uh, you're, you're uh, right on the, the nose here. So yes, both, both have been an issue. So we've seen um, certainly the increase of fentanyl pressed into particularly the Xanax bars that are out there is just tremendous. Um, and, I would say anecdotally, we've seen everything from people who ended up with an overdose who did not expect it at all. They thought they were using a dose that was very familiar to them and, and it, you know, um, thankfully they, they survived that. I'm sure there are people out there who have not. Two people who are actually very explicitly seeking the Xanax with, with fentanyl pressed in it. So you, you see a whole range there. Um, the, in, the benzodiazepine contribution to opi opioid overdose deaths did predate the fentanyl issue though. So I, I would say that was an issue even pre-fentanyl, although I think is a much more concerning issue now. Certainly fentanyl showing up in every element of the drug supply is a concern. Um, the other thing, and, and I talked to somebody at the DEA a couple of years ago about this, um, we have not seen it here. I'm curious if you all have seen it, um, an increase in highly potent synthetic benzodiazepines. So um, my medical colleagues, I'm not a physician, my medical colleagues tell me when they went through medical school, they were told you cannot overdose on a benzodiazepine alone. And it does appear that there are benzodiazepines working its way into, working their way into the drug supply that might be able to be overdosed on on their own because they are some of these synthetics. Um, they're gonna be hard to detect. Are you in drug screens might not detect them, but um, that I think is another trend just to be wary of. Thank you. And uh, that sucks. <laughs> yes, yes, agreed, that sucks. That's, that's probably the best way to sum that up, yes. Uh, Leslie Wood, you had a question? Um, yes, thank you. I come from the world of sociology and um, things like emotional pain and even physical pain are very difficult to measure. But in looking at recovery, I have found um, that sometimes hope is a catalyst for somebody to seek treatment and in despair is some, something that causes people to give up. What do you think, um, given the role of suicide and mental health issues, what do you think the role of hope is in somebody's um, treatment seeking and success at recovery? That's actually such a cool question. So I, I think the first thing that comes to mind, and I can't claim credit for this, my, my division chief, Roger Weiss, who's been doing this for decades, always talks about when he, how he thinks clinically about predictors of who's going to do well. And he says, fear is never enough. You know, that oftentimes people will come into treatment because they're afraid they're going to lose their job or their marriage or their life. And fear is never enough. You need both fear and hope. 
you know, the fear of the negative consequence, but also hope for what might come to the other end of that. Um, I, I think that the hope is absolutely essential when it comes to the, the sort of suicide overdose, you know, the, the deaths of despair term that's been used a lot. Um, that lack of hope and the lack of sort of seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, I think is really important. The other piece that I would add to that though is, uh, again, this sort of desperation for relief, which I think can be really hard to override even with hope because when stress is high enough, and again, you think about someone with an opioid use disorder who may be experiencing some withdrawal, maybe they have an anxiety disorder, you know, life is crumbling around them, that, that hope can be hard to find. But even if there is hope there, that sense of needing relief in the moment can be so potent. Uh, you know, and, and the, uh, this is probably a silly example, but, um, you know, I talk to people about, you imagine you've had just the worst possible day at work and you haven't gotten enough sleep in the last several days and you're stressed and everything's going wrong. There was awful traffic and you're really hungry. You missed lunch because the day was so busy and you're driving home and all you can think about is getting something to eat and, and you're distracted. You can't think about anything else. And when you get home, you're not going to sit down and eat something healthy. That's good for you. You're going to get the thing in your mouth as quickly as possible. That's going to get you some relief of that sensation. And in those moments, we don't see anything else. You don't see 15 minutes from now. You don't see an hour from now. So I think as we both look to develop hope, we do also need something to address this relief issue because I think that can override just about anything. So th that's the thing that I worry about a lot because I don't know that we have great strategies for that yet. Thank you. Lori, uh, you had a question, Lori Dorsey. Hi, yes, thank you. This is really, really informative and so important. So my question is about those who are seeking fentanyl only. And that just seems to be the majority of people that I see are using the fentanyl test strips to you know, make sure that they're getting fentanyl. They want fentanyl. They don't want other drugs. They, they're, not, they're happy they're off heroin, but they want fentanyl. So have they, been, uh, have they been studied as a group to see what is the difference between their mindset and the people that are using other opioids? for their high? Cool, really cool question. It, I don't know. I, I would tell you, we actually have some data that we could look at. So it, it's been interesting. I imagine you've seen this too. It's been interesting to watch the evolution of fentanyl over the last, you know, whatever, six or seven years now, where early on, the folks we were seeing were terrified of fentanyl. In yeah. you know, 2013, 2014, people were coming in and they were saying, how do I protect myself from this? And there was a lot of fear. And over time, we've really started to see that shift. I mean, fentanyl has replaced heroin in the drug supply, certainly in the Boston area. Imagine the, the drug supply down there is probably not all that different. And we do see a group of people who are really seeking it out. Um, I don't know if there's been any sort of systematic study of that cohort, but we actually do. I'm trying to think we have somewhere some data where we actually ask people that if you learned that there was fentanyl in a highly potent drug supply in some region of the state, would you seek it out? Um, so we actually, we probably could take a peek at that and see if there's anything that might characterize that. It would be interesting to see that, you know, the correlation between their mental health issues and that, see if they're more suicidal or more often suicidal. I, d I don't know. I'm taking a note. This is a great suggestion. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Okay, so I'm noticing we're just about out of time. I'll ask one kind of final question and then um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But I was curious, um, you know, as a clinical psychologist and someone came from the world of CBT training as well, I agree with your sentiments around, um, you know, introducing behavioral therapy for mental health concerns. Um, but I also agree with kind of your sentiment around like the buy-in around therapy and sort of, I, I wondered if you have any strategies or thoughts about what is sort of the best way to increase interest in therapy. You know, we, we oftentimes offer it as part of treatment and, and we, I think it can be really helpful, but without sort of that buy-in, it can be difficult to kind of move forward. So I was curious if you had thoughts about that. This is, it's, this is such one, I'm just befuddled by this because, <laughs> you know, and we've published some data on this. And if you look broadly at, at people with psychiatric disorders, they prefer behavior therapy at a rate of about three to one over medications. So if you should ask people their preference, most people prefer therapy. 
in substance use, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna quote my, my department head here. He said, in every clinical trial I've ever done for substance use disorders where you could get just a medication or medication plus behavior therapy, if people didn't get the behavior therapy, they were disappointed, except for my OUD trials. So there seems to be something about this population. What that is, I don't know. Um, my sort of maybe throwing spaghetti at the wall hypothesis about this is that there could be, so not to get too much into the weeds, but the, um, I think it may have been Leslie who had mentioned this idea of, of emotional pain. And emotional pain actually seems to be very specifically mediated by the mu opioid receptor, which is the same receptor that illicit opioids bind onto and give you the euphoria and the high. So there's actually potentially some shared risk between very heightened sensitivity to interpersonal rejection and emotional pain and risk for opioid use disorder. So that's why sort of spaghetti at the wall, I would love to understand that mechanistically. In terms of clinically, how do we encourage people into treatment? I mean, we, we've done everything. We've tried motivational interviewing. We try chasing people around the building, like waiting outside of the prescriber's office to, to bring people in. Um, it, it's, it's a chronic issue. And I would say the only way, particularly in our clinical trials, that we've been able to get people to continue to engage is literally hanging out outside of the prescriber's office and, and linking it to that. Um, people tend to report decent treatment satisfaction. So some of the may be simply a logistical, you know, linking medication and therapy appointments. Um, I, I would also just, just to be a skeptic of all of our work, you know, if people don't buy an iPhone, you come up with a new product. Maybe we need to be thinking about something different in terms of how we package these things or what we're doing. And, you know, are we actually meeting what folks' needs are? Um, I think we should always be rethinking that. Agreed. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Your talk was so informative and I know um, helped reach a lot of people on this webinar today and, and be thoughtful about the role of mental health, which I agree is so important and always needs to be kind of at the forefront of our mind as we're working with individuals who may have substance use disorders. So well, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Yes. Great. Well, thank you all for attending. Mm -hmm.